We are speaking to Roger Steffens, the author of So Much Things to Save the Oral History of Bob Marley, also the former host of a program that one of our listeners emailed us about, a program called Reggae Beat, an award-winning radio program that he co-hosted and acknowledged as something of an authority on reggae music and its history. Why did you pick that for the title? Why So Much Things to Say? Oh, it just seemed the perfect title. It's been used in a lot of Marley books, uh, including books of poetry over the years, uh, but it just seems uh, an appropriate title more, more so than any other uh, of, of his song titles. Uh, and there are so many myths out there and misconceptions and, and outright lies that continue to be circulated. And uh, a lot more is known now and more people are willing to talk and there's a lot of nonsense that still goes around out, out there that I, I tried to uh, explain in my new book. Is that part of what you wanted to depict in this book, this kind of duality or more of a multi-varied, multifaceted Bob Marley than maybe what the world came to idolize him for? Yeah, absolutely. There are so many things to say about Bob. You for know, sure. It's a never-ending story is the story that keeps on giving. For sure there are. For sure there are. Uh, he was not a saint. He, he never had a real bed until about 18 months before he passed away when some of the women in his life got together and bought him a bed. And Jonathan went to Nine Mile and interviewed a bunch of Bob's relatives and one of Bob's cousins told him that Bob said he had 19 children. And uh, I think Bob would be enormously proud of his children. Um, Ziggy has won so many Grammys over the years and, and so have others of his children. And now his grandchildren are performing as well. We saw Skip Marley at the Grammys this year, uh, playing with Katy Perry. Yeah, um, Skip Marley, who has that uh, music break in uh, Chain to the Rhythm by Katy Perry. Yeah, and now there's brands of, of Bob Marley marijuana being sold, and uh, I think that would have pleased him too. And you're Roger, as I understand it, there was kind of a fraught relationship. I wonder though about Joe Higgs, uh, Roger Steffens. His relationship with Bob Marley was a little bit fraught, wasn't it? It was, and I've never been able to really pinpoint that. Uh, Joe died in 99, and I had been working for several years with him on his autobiography also, who's known as the father of reggae, to be Bob Marley's tutor and uh, give him all his very necessary early training in vocal technique, mic technique, stagecraft, harmony, uh, composing the real hero in Bob Marley's story and he figures from front to back of the book is Joe Higgs and uh, there were some difficulties in the later period of their relationship and as I said earlier he was the man most responsible for the early development of Bob uh, they were going to do a, a tour and in order to replace Bunny Whaler they turned to Joe Higgs and at the end of the tour, they didn't pay him anything. And uh, shortly after, in early 74, Joe Higgs' brother died and he didn't have any money to, to bury him. And he went to Bob. Finally, he was summoned to Bob's office and uh, Bob said, what's wrong? And he told him and uh, Bob said, okay, I'll give you $2,000 for the tour. And when he got the check, it was only $1,500, and he used that to bury his brother. And then there was a time later in the uh, 1970s when Joe was about to lose his house. Wow. And yet he would not give Joe the money to save his house, and Joe was put out onto the street. So there are some things that haven't been talked about publicly before. For sure there are. Oh, my favorite Bob Marley song is Waiting in Vain, a great love song from the Exodus album. And of course, Time Magazine chose Exodus as the album of the 20th century. Uh, Linton Kwesi Johnson, the great British uh, Jamaican dub poet, wrote the introduction to my new book. And he, uh, he's a fascinating man. He, he's the only living poet ever anthologized in the uh, Penguin Great Poetry series. And he says that uh, Waiting in Vain is the greatest love song ever written. <laughs> and it's funny because Chris Blackwell uh, of Island Records, Bob's label, says that he, he thinks Bob never nailed the song. Here is Bob Marley and Waiting in Vain. Oh, he's 
feels good. <laughs> but he was madly in love at the time he wrote that with Cindy Breakspear. And sadly, he virtually never did that song live because uh, Rita, his wife, uh, was uh, upset that it, it seemed to be about uh, another woman. Virtually all the backing tracks on the Exodus album are one woman, Marcia Griffiths, triple tracking her own voice to sound like all three of the I3. Well, we actually did get a question about uh, Rita, again, to try to get at some of the conceptions about the relationship. Josh emailed us, was the relationship with his wife Rita an open relationship? Bob was famously known for having multiple relationships with other women, and in 2004, Rita Marley claimed that he raped her. They both, from the time they knew each other, um, had relationships outside of the marriage. Bob had outside lovers. Um, after a while, uh, Rita said she was acting more like Bob's mother or caretaker. So she wouldn't sing it with him, and uh, it 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 was. I wouldn't call it an open marriage in in the American sense of that, where where people remain married and um, continue to have children together. As to the rape allegation, well, I wasn't there. I don't know. But I I really don't know. First, this is a clip from the song We End Up. Listen. <laughs> That's We and Dem performed by Bob Marley. Roger Stephens, what's the story behind that particular piece of tape? There was at least an hour of unknown material with lines like, the jury found I guilty and I found them guilty too. I'm a jailbreaker, hot stepper. And he was, these were probably from around 1977, shortly after he had been shot and was in exile. The only thing on the whole two hours of tapes that we recognized was that little snatch of, of We and Dem, which was finally put out on his last album, An Uprising. And um, some people think it's about the struggles he was having with the other whalers. Some people think he's talking about the cancer cells in his body. Mm. Um, we don't know how we and them are go work things out. Would you say that the inspiration, Roger, for songs like Redemption Song was mostly political, spiritual, a blend of all of the above? Well, I think he would deny it was political because he eschewed politics. Never make a politician grant you a favor, he said. He will only want to control you forever. I think it's because he's a hero to young people. He's a rebel. He smoked herb. He talked about overthrowing an illegitimate system, although he used a word I probably shouldn't say on NPR mm -hmm. to describe that system. And Redemption Song has become a universal anthem, too. I remember being part of the Women's March here in L.A. on the 21st of January, 750,000 people protesting against Trump and uh, for Planned Parenthood. And uh, in the uh, opening stages of the, the rally, the very first song that was played to the crowd was Redemption Song. Yeah, one gentleman tweeted me earlier today, or actually the, the, uh, the organization that's, one of the organizations that's working for enfranchisement for voters in Washington, D.C. to have more representation in Congress by basically becoming a county, uh, tweeted me this morning to say that yesterday this effort <sighs> adopted Zion Train by Bob Morley as their the theme song of their effort. A number of our listeners said that some of his more socially and politically relevant music was among their favorites. We've gotten a lot of notes from you about your feelings on Bob Marley. One of you tweeted us, thank you for producing today's show. Bob Marley's influence and activism is pivotal even till today. Gotta love this man.
Nancy Berg, who was a retired middle school teacher, emailed, Bob Marley and his music were key components in the fine arts curriculum for a sixth grade special issues program that I had the honor of teaching for five years during the early 90s. Songs like Get Up, Stand Up were important teaching points for political activism and a great influence on my young students' minds and character. His songs are very relevant in today's political scene. Deborah agrees with you, Nancy, about the res relevance of that. Deborah tweeted, more poignant now than ever, get up, stand up, stand up for your rights. Get up, stand up, don't give up the fight. Cecilia tweeted, my favorite track is Redemption Song. I sing this as a lullaby for my daughters, even for myself, when social injustice occurs. Hashtag Venezuela, referring to the unrest there with the, the government under President Nicolas Maduro and all of the violence happening now in Venezuela. Let's listen to a little piece of Redemption Song. Redemption song by Bob Marley. Yeah. And we'll be hearing a lot of Bob Marley music as the hour goes on, including Waiting in Vain. So we'll, we'll get to that a little bit later on. As I look at the introduction that she mentioned by Linton Kwesi Johnson, it reads in part, quote, The overall impression we get of Marley is that of a man of some complexity, taciturn and jovial by turns, worldly and spiritual, a sleeping lion capable of violent rage. That's from the introduction to So Much Things to Say, written by Linton Kwesi Johnson. How much do you think that the attempts on his life were a function of the political environment in which he was in which he was living and working. Oh, I, I think totally, totally had to do with politics. There are, in fact, four chapters in my new book uh, about the Smile Jamaica assassination attempt and uh, the background of, of various people involved in that, including Carl Colby, whose uh, father had been the uh, fired head of the CIA. Did the CIA? have anything to do with the assassination attempt on Bob Marley's life. And um, I ended up believing that they didn't. And uh, it, it was an attack on him by members of the, uh, the JLP, the Jamaica Labor Party, led by a notorious gunman named Jim Brown, who was one of the chief enforcers for Edward Siaga's right-wing party. And it has been said that Siaga put the word out that the Smile Jamaica concert must not happen because there were going to be elections shortly after and it appeared as if Bob was uh, supporting the re-election of the socialist Michael Manley at the time. And uh, nobody ever interviewed Carl Colby who's been accused in magazines and books of, of having a direct link to the shooters. and. Um, I found Carl Colby in the Beverly Hills phone book and called him up and invited him over to the archives on the anniversary of, of the shooting uh, back in, uh, I think, 2006. And uh, he was flabbergasted to hear these charges and, and made a very powerful defense of uh, why he was not involved. He was, was, in fact, a big Bob Marley fan who had been a a documentary filmmaker in New York whose crew had been hired by Chris Blackwell to come and film the Smile Jamaica concert. That's how he found himself there. He arrived in Jamaica, in fact, uh, as Bob was being shot and heard about it at the airport. It, they, they were interested in, in Marley as a, a figure who, uh, around whom uh, rebels were, were forming. Um, so there's a lot of nonsense that still goes around out, out there that I, I tried to uh, explain. <laughs> believe me, if I could find any evidence at all, I would be shouting it from the housetops, believe me. In essence, uh, a little tarnish on the halo, and now his grandchildren are performing as well. We saw Skip Marley at the Grammys this year. Uh, playing with Katy Perry. Yes, Skip um, Marley was that uh, music break in uh, Chain to the Rhythm by Katy Perry. Yeah, I know there's brands of, of Bob Marley marijuana being sold, and uh, I think that would have pleased him too. So, you know, jaw willing, someday the Roger Stephens Reggae Archives will be a, a museum in Jamaica. Say a prayer. <laughs> and very briefly, Roger, any questions that you wanted to get answered in this book that you couldn't get answered? That's a good question. Uh, the ultimate answer to the world's problems is love. So as Bob would say, what's wrong with singing about love?
I, I don't want you to think that this is a very negative book about Bob. He had a remarkable life. It's almost as if he lived three lives in one. One Love is maybe his most famous song. It was a song the BBC used for its 24-hour round-the-world coverage of the millennium. As each time zone came into the millennium, people locally sang One Love as the anthem of the millennium, the song that everybody around the world knew. He, oh, he just feels good. That's Roger Steffens, the author of the new book, So Much Things to Say, The Oral History of Bob Marley.